and we shall be glad in it. I am Minister Adams, and I'm here to give you your occasion of today. Today, 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 today. We are here today and this month to celebrate black history. Come on. 
Come on and clap your hands for that today. Right there, our Facebook and YouTube family, we will be celebrating black history all month long. Somebody say, all month long. Amen, amen. At this time, we're going to call Elder Paula Pulley to, um, to the roster today, and she will go on further, and she will give our black history, not only black history, but she will give our church history on today. Welcome, Elder Paula Pulley. <laughs> This morning, I stand before you to talk about the great history of Mount Calvary Holy Church, Concord, North Carolina. Yes, Lord. Mount Calvary Holy Church of Concord, North Carolina was established in February 1932. The church started in a brick building called Gurley Far Hall, which was located on Five Points Corner on Lincoln Street in Concord. The first pastor of the church was Elder P.H. Patterson, who served for three years. The late Reverend Estelle House was his assistant and became the pastor in 1926. Under the leadership of this mighty woman of God, people had a mind to work. The trustees, deacons, and other members of the church sacrificed their time and what little money they had to build God an edifice located at 251 Shannon Drive. Reverend House remained pastor for 54 years. In her time of illness, Bishop Dr. Harold I. William and state overseer Bishop Frizzell Yelverton sent Elden, Elder Elvin Mickens Sr. to assist Pastor House in reestablishing the church. Under the leadership of Elder Mickens, the church experienced explosive growth and in 1991, he was installed as the third pastor of Mount Calvary Concord. As the membership increased under the leadership of Pastor Mickens, there was a need to build an edifice to accommodate the growth and to house the vision. While waiting for the new church to be built, services were held in several locations. The first move was to the old courthouse theater, then later services were held at J.M. Freeze Middle School, and finally the old church was renovated, and two services were held there each Sunday until the new church was built. In March of 1999, a portion of the vision came to fruition when the members and friends of Mount Calvary marched from 251 Shannon Drive to 401 Lincoln Street and entered the new sanctuary. The present location sits on five acres of land. The first of three phases is a 16,000 square foot multi-purpose facility that serves as a site for the sanctuary, a child development center, a senior day center, classroom offices, and a baptism pool. Mount Calvary Concord continues to fulfill its mission of reaching the community one family at a time, later changed to impact and lives for the kingdom through many in-reach and outreach ministries. These ministries included Calvary's Leadership Academy, ministerial classes, new members orientation, premarital classes, strategic resources incorporated, CDC, Wednesday night empowerment, Essence Women's Ministry, Move Men's Ministry, Merging Hearts Marriage Ministry, Singles Ministry, G3 Youth Ministry, The Rock Church, Kingdom Kids, <laughs> Music Ministry, Praise Team known as the Warriors of Praise, Kingdom Youth Choir, Full Expression Ministry of the Arts, The Impact Center, formerly The Refuge. Mount Calvary history would not be complete if we did not recognize a group of resolute and committed pioneers who made this possible through their hard work and sacrifice. We pay homage to those that have transitioned to glory. Elder P.H. Patterson, Pastor Estelle House, Reverend Ella Caldwell, Reverend Willie Scott, 
Deacon James Grant Sr., Trustee Arthur Green, Trustee Sidney Pfeiffer, Elder Bill Livingston, Evangelist Bertha Gamble, Deacon Johnny Anderson, Deacon Fletcher House, Deacon Willie House, Mother Hattie Batts, Mother Sadie Greer, Mother Helen House, Mother Mean, Mother Hattie Ross, Mother Rosa Strickland, Mother Shirley White, Brother Joseph Caldwell, Brother Bobby Livingston, Sister Mary Livingston, Sister Alberta Long, and Sister Louise McNeil. Ministry Milestones, 1999, the erection of this new edifice, Calvary Academy, began and closed at 2010. Loving Years Adult Health and Day Program began and closed in 2001. First Lady Darlene Mickens appointed as co-pastor of Mount Calvary Holy Church Family Worship Center in 2001. Pastor Elvin Mickens was consecrated as the North Carolina State Overseer at the Mount Calvary Holy Church of America 74th International Holy Convocation in Washington, D.C. 2008. Overseer Mickens was consecrated bishop during the 79th International Holy Convocation in Washington, D.C. 2017, Bishop Mickens was elevated to the office of jurisdictional bishop of the North Carolina Piedmont jurisdiction. 2020 through 2021, there were building upgrades and purchases of new equipment. And in 2021, Bishop Mickens was elevated and consecrated to the office of second vice bishop of the Mount Calvary Holy Church of America Incorporated. Mount Calvary has not forgotten about its humble origin, purpose, or its destiny. It is committed to the principles of Christ and becoming more concerned with the world problems and the problems found at his doors. We give God the glory. We thank him for the experiences of the past, the joys of the present, the vision of the future, and the lives of our past and present. We have come this far by the power of God. At this time, I would like to recognize a few of our legacy members. Deacon Scotty Boulware, and I ask that you all stand. These are our legacy members that grew up here in Mount Calvary. Mother Betty Black. Mother Tiny Green. Brother Lamont Green. And Mother Quincy House. Mount Calvary Conca, we have a rich legacy. And not only to celebrate it during black history, we to celebrate it at all times throughout the year. We are connected to a strong heritage here at Mount Calvary. Yes, Mother Sadie Gray's children. Curtis and Sarah. Praise the Lord. Service is now in the hands of the warriors of praise. Come on, standing all over the building. Come on, let's give God the praise. Come on, let's honor him. Hallelujah for black history. Come on, let's honor him for the church history. And come on, let's honor him for your personal history. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that is done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Oh, ho, 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 ho. my soul looks back and wonder how I got over. How did I make it out of that? It is the goodness of the Lord. It is the mercy of God that we made it through. Now come on and clap your hands. And give your God the praise. He's a mighty God in this place. Hey, come on, put your hands up. Hey. Come on, come on. I can't see you out there. Put your hands together. Hey. Hey. Don't fool me now. Did you break your play today? Hey.
protected me. Hallelujah. It was the hand of the Lord that protected me. It was the hand of the Lord that covered me. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. before him heaven and earth simply to adore him what a mighty God we serve he holds the sun in his place he holds the moon in his place he holds the earth in his place can I get a witness Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He holds our soul in this place. Glory, glory, what, a God. what a mighty God. How many glad today that we serve a mighty God? But how many come to worship a mighty God? How many come to praise a mighty God? Oh, my God. How many times has he brought you out? Because he's a mighty God. Look at somebody and tell him, say, he's a 
almighty God. I literally exist because he's a mighty God. Because in him we live. And in him we move. And in him we have our being. Hallelujah. How many come to give him just one more round of praise? Oh, I wish I had a praising church in the house today. Tell somebody, say, you don't know what I've been through this week. But thanks be to God, I made it. I made it because he's a mighty God. Because he keeps on doing great things for me. Do I have a witness in the house? That he keeps on doing great things for you. He keeps on doing great things for your family. He keeps on doing great things for your children. Come on, let's give God praise. Because he keeps on doing. Matter of fact, I don't know where I'd be right now without God. I don't know where I'd be right now without Jesus. Because if it had not been for the Lord, who has been on our side, I can surely testify we don't know where we would be right now. But, but look at somebody say, but his goodness and his mercy, I'm still here. Through his goodness and his mercy, I'm still here. I wonder if somebody can give him a praise because you're still here. Woo. I'm not on a hospital bed. I don't have any tubes running out of my body. I praise him because I'm still here. And I got some activities of my limb. Somebody ought to give him praise. Praise him because you woke up this morning. Praise him because he was the one that got you out of your bed. Praise him because he's the one that covered your life. Praise him because he stayed back the hands of the devil. Oh, my, 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 my. Hallelujah. Look at our neighbor and say, I got to praise him. Because I know it could have went another way. Oh, my, 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 my. Woo! I done been in some car accidents. I done been around evil and trouble. It could have been another way. But I praise him because God blocked it. Oh my. And I'm glad that it didn't go another way. Somebody said the devil thought he had me, but I got away. Do I have a witness over here that can say the devil thought he had you, but you got away? He gave me beauty for my ashes. I got away. He turned my life around. I got away. Hallelujah. Oh my. I've been through many dangers, toils, and snares. But he brought me from a mighty, mighty, mighty long way. Slap somebody high five and said he brought me from a mighty long way. If you only knew where I came from. If you only knew what I was held down by, 
if you only knew what stronghold had me. But God brought me out. your hand in the air and say he turned it around just for me oh, you sometimes you just gotta praise him because he turned it around when nobody could turn it around he brought you out of places nobody could have got you out of he recovered you from some stuff you didn't think you would ever recover from Hallelujah. So that's why I can praise him. The songwriter said, I just can't stop praising his name. I just can't stop praising his name. Yeah. Tell somebody, say, he did it. I wonder if I got anybody here that have a he did it praise. He did it. I feel the Holy Ghost. If you praise him a few more seconds, I believe the Holy Ghost will slay this place. Yeah. Woo. I know we dressed in civic attire, but he's still good. I know you got your best coming to Sunday church, but he's still good. Tell somebody say he's still good. And I never can get so dressed up that I can't get messed up. Somebody ought to give your God a praise. Hallelujah. Woo. That's why the church used to say, I'm glad to be in the number. One more time. If I'm in the number one more time, I believe I, he deserves one more praise. Woo. Bye, 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 bye. That's why we can say, don't judge my praise. You don't know what this praise calls me. You don't know what this praise calls me. Don't judge my praise. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't judge my praise, baby. Because you don't know what this praise calls me. You don't know what God did to bring me out of the mess I was in. Don't judge my praise. Don't judge my leap. Don't judge my holler. Don't judge my running. Don't judge my dancing. Because you wasn't there. You wasn't there. Look at somebody say, excuse me. You wasn't there. I got to go for myself. Because sometimes the only thing I got left after I've been through what I've been through is nothing but a praise. And my praise can bring me some deliverance. Woo! That's all right. That's all right. You don't know what that baby girl been through don't judge it baby look at somebody say don't judge it get in it get in the praise of God I seen people get delivered in praise Yet I see another. I see demons leave in praise. 
Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Mm. If you don't know how to praise him, just wave your hand in the air. Give him something. Because many of us know we should have been gone a long time ago. Look at somebody say, but God. Oh, don't act like you got it all together. Because Paul says such was some of us. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You ain't too far removed from walking the street. But by the mercies of God, we're still here. You ought to give God praise. We ain't too far removed from being homeless. But by the mercies of God, we still got a place to go to. Don't judge my praise. Hey, hey. Glory to God. Now we're getting ready to close this out. But help me with this. Look at somebody say, I'm getting ready to praise God for your breakthrough right now. Hey, hey, hey. Come on, come on. Tell somebody, so I'm getting ready to praise God for your breakthrough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you break through, I believe a chain reaction will occur. And I'll get some too. So tell somebody, so I'll praise him for your breakthrough. I believe it's in this praise right about here. Tell somebody, say, it's in this praise. So, so I say it, let me say it like this. If you see a good praise, get in it. <laughs> Woo! Yes, sir. Look at a neighbor say, if you see a good praise, get in it. If you see somebody praising God, just join in with them. Let's clap it to the Lord of praise, all you people. He's worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, he's worthy to be praised. 2024 has just changed the scope of my praise. It becomes more like what David said, I'll bless the Lord at all times. And his praises shall continually be in my mouth. So look at a neighbor as you take your seat and, and tell him, say, I might praise him anytime doing this service. Come on, put those hands together. Uh, you better watch it now. It's, it's kind of explosive in here. I'll praise him anytime. And I find one of my best times to praise him is in my pain. I find some of the best time to praise him is in my disappointments. I find the best time to praise him is in my darkness. I believe if I'm in my darkness and I'm in my pain, things gonna turn around sooner or later. Somebody ought to give him praise. My, my circumstance don't control my praise. My praise control my circumstance. I said my praise. My circumstance don't control my praise. But 
my praise control my circumstance. Woo. Some people might be controlled by their circumstance. But my circumstance don't control my praise. Because my circumstance don't understand my praise. I feel the Holy Ghost. Tell somebody that my circumstance don't understand my praise. I supposed to be down, but my hand fly up. Oh! I supposed to be crying, but I'm smiling. supposed to be quiet but I get louder because my circumstance don't control my praise I supposed to be sitting there all cute and all together but all of a sudden I just jump up and go to shout because I know sooner or later things got to get better. Look at somebody say, I got some scars to prove it. I got some wounds to prove it that he's able to heal me. Sooner or later things got to get better. So what I'm going to do I'm going to praise him before it get there. Because my circumstance don't control my praise. But my praise control my circumstance. Hallelujah. Tell somebody that put that on Facebook today. My circumstance don't control my praise, but my praise control my circumstance. Uh, that came straight from God. Hallelujah. Somebody need to hear that. So anytime you get down this week, you just put your hand on yourself and say, my praise gonna control my circumstance all right let's put those hands together one more time we got my lord we honor the <laughs> we honor the presence of the lord in, in this place Ooh. And we thank god for all of our friends and all of our guests that are here today that's in person. We really thank you for coming out and amen just to give God all the glory and so good to see familiar faces and new faces and we're grateful today and we're certainly grateful for all of those that have come to join us by way of social media. Amen. Here at the Mount Calvary Holy Church Family Worship Center in the great city of Concord, North Carolina where we believe in changing and impacting lives for the kingdom. Amen. I certainly honor again. I honor my lovely and gorgeous wife. Amen. My friend for life. I thank God for her. Amen. And she's such a wonderful preacher, teacher in her own right. And I thank God for her. Amen. I don't know what I'd do without her. I'm grateful for all of the great leaders of this church. Amen. So many that God has blessed us with and gifted people and thank God for such a wonderful congregation come on let's thank God for Calvary amen thank God for this wonderful praise team always amen just ushered us into the presence of God so quickly right where you are let's kind of shift our mind 
into a mode for prayer. So right where you are, will you join with me in prayer as we share something that's going to help you today. Father, we thank you and we bless you. You're such an awesome and wonderful God and thank you for the courts of praise and worship. Thank you for people that have a mind to worship you. And we say thank you. Thank you, God, because you have appointed this time to speak to us and to speak to us by this wayside. So now let the entrance of thy word give light and understanding to us. Encourage us. Build us up. Redirect our thoughts and our lives. And we'll give you glory. We'll give you honor. And we'll give you praise. Come on, put those hands together one more time. Everybody say the year of power. Amen, amen. We have been, amen, led by God to talk about the year of power throughout this year. And for those that are here for the first time, we are grateful, amen, that you've come where God has, put, has placed us on a path to talk about 2024 as to be a year of power. And the reason why, because he said he's going to be able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or think according to his power that worketh within us. So this year is not uh, solely about God but it is also about us. It's about us as a, his creation. And um, I love it because uh, when you think of power, the word power means authority, of course. And that authority uh, it also means strength and force and dominion. But what I also love about, amen, this word power it also means the ability to carry out what's entrusted to those that believe. So, amen. This is, this is not only a year that God is going to show up, but this is a year that we are going to show up as a creation of God. Amen. So God started us out in January and focused us on power up. Everybody say power up. Mm -hmm. Amen. He taught us about power up. Amen. And how that would allow us, amen, to gain more energy and power to operate and be prepared to be used. And within that, God wanted us to know in January we learned how to reclaim uh, the power within. We also learn how to go back to the basics. Amen. To regain godly focus. Uh, we also learn some things about how to become a stronger witness for the Lord. But the greatest thing that I think that we gathered from uh, last month's teaching was the fact that God is not selfish about sharing his power. He's not selfish. And I'm grateful because, amen, he, if, he, if he had become selfish, I wouldn't be standing here today. But I'm grateful. Glory to God. And as we now began to break into a new month, God wants to change our focus and to see this power from another perspective. As I sat and listened to the history of Mount Calvary, what I glean from that is that it took God's power to allow Mount Calvary to be able to do the things that they have done in this community. 
And it's, it's wonderful because sometimes you can be in a church and really don't know anything about the church. But I always say, if you don't learn your history, you'll never be able to focus on your future. Because everybody came from somewhere. And so I am spiritually proud to say that Calvary has a rich and powerful history. Come on, amen. And I am privileged to be a part of that. But as we enter into this second month, February, of the first quarter of the year, my general focus area will be centered around what is called cultural power. Uh, I, and and, and, and I, I want to lay a foundation first. Cultural power has not really been talked about in the church like it used to be. Cultural power. You see, and uh, within, uh, it, we're focused around cultural power in which uh, this is a perfect timing for this time of the year. It's in this month called February. We have marked it as Black History Month. Now, please don't let the enemy try to twist it. Because people want to always say when you start talking about your culture, you're coming from a racial divide. But every culture needs to understand that they have power. Can I get a witness? So this, this, this month is not going to be geared toward a racial divide. It's going to be geared toward cultural power to a people known as black people. I, I, can, I can't get no witness in here. But, but because culture is such a broad subject, I want to start off with uh, the basics about culture. Before we get into the specifics of culture, in which this case, a man in this month, it is centered around black culture. So as an introduction to the power of culture, a man, I just want to subtitle this in a way to talk about the power of culture as a series of the power of culture because as I stated before, a culture has power. Why? Because culture is power. Uh, look at someone and say, culture is power. Now, I, I can't preach this to you. I have to teach this to you. Culture is power. And one thing that I've noticed as I grew up and as I became older, I've seen other cultures take a lot of pride in themselves, but I haven't grasped the idea that we as a people take a lot of pride in who we are. Can I get a witness? So let me start off again by saying, if you don't understand the potential of your power, you will often misuse and abuse your power as it relates to a human culture. If we don't understand the potential Look at someone beside you and tell them there's some potential in you. And if you don't understand or we don't teach about potential, we will oftentimes misuse and abuse the powers that God has given us as a culture. Culture is a word that for centuries, centuries, hear me now, centuries has been one of the most misunderstood, mis, uh, misused, and abused word in the world. Culture. Everybody shout back to me, culture. 
It, why? Because uh, when you really think about it, uh, the misunderstanding of a thing is directly connected to the misuse of a thing, which will often lead to the abuse of a thing, which becomes inevitable. In other words, we can be a part of a culture, but we can abuse ourselves because we don't know who we are. We don't understand what God has done for us, what God has put in us. So abuse and misuse becomes inevitable. What do you mean by that, Bishop? Well, let me just kind of uh, uh, let me just kind of put it in this way: uh, as a black people today, we still live this out every day as an acceptable norm, as an acceptable norm. If you look at the statistics, as 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 as, as populated as America is. 60% of black America is trapped behind prison walls. Sounds like we have not grasped, amen, uh, uh, the, the, the potential of our culture. Can I get a witness? Amen. And when you look at us from the social status to the economical status, we are not even at the brink of being equal because we don't know the potential that lies within us as a culture. So we get caught up in other things because we don't know and we end up abusing ourselves and our children abuse themselves and on the streets we, they abuse themselves and we never reach our full potential because nobody talked to us amen, about the, the richness of a culture. I believe that a part of our struggle of, of inequality and mistreatment of our culture is largely due to the ignorance of the value and the potential of who and what we are as a part of God's creation. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I want to settle in. Because, amen, until we understand who and what we are, we will always struggle with being mistreated. We will always accept inequality. We will always settle for the lesser rather than the more. We will not strive to make ourselves better as a people because the norm is you do like everybody else does when nobody's doing nothing when God is trying to tell you that he is not biased and nobody's better than you. You are equal to everybody else. Therefore, you have the same opportunity to become whatever you want to become in this life when you realize your potential. We spend more money in prison, on prison, than we do in education. Oh, y'all not going to talk to me in here. And I have been an advocate trying to keep young men, let me talk to young men, out of the prison walls because it is designed to cause them to not to prosper in society. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. Do I have any mothers? Do I have any fathers? You have been praying that your children will not go the wrong way when there is a system set up that will cause your children to struggle all their life and put them at a disadvantage in life because we don't teach amen the potential of who we are and what we are in this society. You see, the limits of this is not always racism, bias, or prejudice, even though they are manipulated through systemic systems of people driven by evil hearts. Let me say that again. It's not always racism, 
It's not always bias. It's not always prejudice. Even though there is a, there, there is a systemic system of people driven by evil hearts. But it's not always that. But one of the strongest holds of misuse and abuse is simple ignorance of the potential of a thing. Now, the word ignorant is not a word that is a word that is that make you feel less. The word ignorance says, I just don't know. And for centuries, amen, we have been trapped. We have been at a disadvantage because nobody tells us the potential that we have in ourselves. And sometimes our children don't even understand why we push them so hard. Why we are constantly trying to drive them to become the best they can and they push back on it and say why you keep pushing me and the reason why we do it because we had to deal with the struggles that they were not yet ready to deal with and we was trying to prepare them to be able to deal with society can I get a witness and most of our young people eh, that cannot handle pressure because the truth be told, we have a baby them and we have covered them and we have given them stuff so much that they don't understand how to deal and be prepared to deal with the struggles of life. So they have no coping skills. So what the enemy does, he manipulates that and pushes them into a world to make them feel and make them feel good. But yes, it's destroying their minds, their hopes, and their dreams. Am I talking all right? And we have to not only, amen, hear it from people outside in the world, but we need to hear it from the church. The church needs to go back to teaching the, about the pride of human life, what it really means to have a life, and what it really means to have, amen, pride within yourself as a people. From the Bible days until now, this ignorance still exists and is alive and well. And, and, and it's not just our culture. It, it, it exists in a lot of other cultures. But when you go to the Bible, you can see it clearly. Because the Bible said in Exodus 1, there was a king that rose up that didn't know the God of Joseph. And he began to put a people, a culture, in captivity. But as he was putting them there, he saw something in them that they didn't see. He said to his people, behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Now catch this, he had them in captivity. He had them in a systemic system of hard labor. But he saw the potential that they didn't see. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because they had become comfortable in a systemic system of working hard and having nothing. Because they didn't know who they really was. But the taskmaster knew the potential that's in them. And so I come to perk your spiritual mind and heart and eyes to understand that there's more to you than meets the eye. And you got to stop blaming the system and begin to look inside of you to understand that you are mightier just like everybody else is. 
Why? Why? Why, Bishop, are you talking this way? Why are you not talking about blessings and shoutings and why are you not prophesying to us? No, I don't need to prophesy to you. I need to talk some truth to you so you can learn how to live in this real world because this is a real world full of evil. Why? Because I believe God created every culture with power as his creation. Every culture has power. Glory to God. Because the devil, a man for ages, has been tricking us and manipulating us. Because, see, spirits don't get old. Let me say that again. Spirits don't get old. We do. Are you here? They move from generation to generation. So what our forefathers and mothers had to deal in the cotton field. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. That spirit is still working in the generations that we live in right now and the generations that are getting ready to come. It's just been a bad packaged in another way. It's a different type. Everybody says it's a different type. It's a different type of cotton field. You ain't picking cotton. I done been on the cotton field. That's work. I was sitting out there with my grandmama and grandfather. I, I saw them pick cotton. That was work all day long. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. Amen. But that same thing is happening right now through technology. There is a technological cotton field that's picking the minds of our children. And they have not come to know who they are. They will spend more time looking at a screen rather than to understand who they are and what they're going to be in life. And the sad thing about it, we pay for it. Y'all want me to, I know y'all want me to stop, but I got to talk some truth here. We spend our hard-earned money to get them into a screen of a make-believe world. Y'all don't hear me in here. And that's why they can't deal with the real world because they're so caught up in the make-believe world. In my days, we had Casper the Ghost. They called him the friendly ghost. Now they got meta. Y'all don't like this talking here. Where they put on a whole screen on their face and they get in the world and if you look at them from the outside, they boxing, they're throwing, and then you don't even see who they're throwing at because they're in another world. But let me close, let me let me close this out here. Because you gotta understand addictions come in every form. We had drug addictions, we had alcohol addictions, but now there's a technological addiction that's just as bad as taking the drug. Y'all don't like just talk up in here. Because these kids will stay in a screen, don't eat, don't drink, don't talk, don't want to communicate. When your kid cannot hold a conversation with you in your own house, something is controlling their minds and you're paying for it. Tell somebody, say, don't get mad at the bishop. It's the real deal. Why? Because evil is always present. That's, that's what the scripture says. Paul said, when I would do good, evil 
is always present. Glory to God. Why? Because the devil, the Bible says the devil is like a thief. He cometh but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. You got to catch what I'm saying. He comes to steal hope. He comes to steal potential. He comes to destroy dreams and visions. And if your children, you know, we, we, we would just dream of being somebody when I came up. We, you, you, just, you just wanted to be somebody in the inner city. You just, you just drove to be somebody. Body. Can I get a witness? Because you saw so many people that didn't make it that you had to decree in your own self that, I, that you had to make it. If I would have never been in church, I was still going to be a successful black man because I seen too many black men fail. Can I be truthful? Let me talk to the sisters. Can you find a good one now? Don't get scared on me, sister. Don't get y'all getting scared. Y'all don't even want to clap your hands. Y'all know y'all getting y'all look coveys and get to talking and say, I can't find a good man now. You know why? Because nobody sits down and tell a man that he has potential to be a man. So when you don't tell him he has the potential to be a man, he'll try to be something else. Y'all catch that, right? Y'all caught that, didn't y'all? Why? 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 Because the enemy ultimate desire is to blind the mind. God. Paul said, he said, if this gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God, little g, of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. So now it's, so, it's such a talent to try to get people to believe and our children to believe even when they were raised up in the church. You, you brought them to Sunday school. You, you, you made them sit up there on the front row. You told them, look, when we leave this house, you go on to church. Y'all don't hear me up here. And when they get older, they don't want to go to church because what happened, amen, it's not in the going to church. It's what you learn while you're in church. The problem is we have been bringing them to church, but we haven't been teaching them about the God that is the controller of their life. So therefore, they just come to church and see you shout and don't get nothing out of it because they don't have a relationship with God. They see your relationship, but they don't have one. So when they get old, the enemy blinds their minds from the gospel. talking let's 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 talk real how many of our children that's raised up in the church stay in the church so that one day they can run the church huh look at somebody and say my 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 because you do know we're gonna get old if i let this hair grow you'll see some gray I just keep it bald so you won't see nothing. But there's some gray there because I'm getting old. But I want to know who's going to take this thing after I get old. Uh-huh, uh-huh. If we don't teach responsibility to our children, what can we leave to them? When we get, old, when we get older, we can have a house, but if they don't know how to take care of a bedroom, yeah. If they don't clean up the bedroom because you don't teach them how to clean it up, you can leave my house, but they'll tear it up every time. Y'all getting quiet on me in here. Tell somebody, say, all because 
we don't understand the original plan for human culture. See, we are talking, of, we are, we're, we are going to talk more about the black culture, but we really got to go back to the human culture. Because God created a man, human culture, he never created it to separate. He created it to work together as one race of people. But the problem was, we didn't understand. We didn't understand the potential of culture. And evil, watch this, evil is always present. And it's always present to promote sin. Which, perpetual, which we perpetually experience in culture, which I call culture shock. We're in culture shock. The wine and summer song has said, it ain't like that anymore. Where was the days? The days when men and boys will become men, and girls will become women. He said it ain't like that anymore because we've lost the score. Somewhere in that, we have experienced culture shock. And culture shock is when, a culture, when cultures change with no set purpose or definitions for existence. So now, death becomes a normal. When I was coming up, you didn't hear a lot about it, but you heard it was there. But now, when you turn the TV on, that's all you hear. The young are dying, and the seasoned are living longer. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because we are in culture shock. Taking a life is a norm. We used to fight on the playground. Y'all don't talk to me either. We'd fight, we'd fall out, and we'd be friends before the end of a day. Can I get a witness? Or if you got whipped and you went home crying, your mama and your daddy would send you back out there. Y'all don't want to talk to me either. Get on back out there. Hallelujah. Now, when people disagree and young people, rather than to handle it that way, now they are shoot and kill. And let me tell you, death is final. Let me say something to these young people. Death is final. You can't come back after death. Are you, I'm talking biblical. Now. The Bible says when you're gone, you're gone. I don't care what dream you had. I don't care what you say came to your house, what you say came in your room. When you leave here, you're going right into judgment. The Bible says it. Oh, y'all getting quiet in me? It's final. And the reality is we have to bring this back to our people to understand how important culture is because God never intended culture to be a thing that separates. Culture, amen, is, is, in general is a word that encompasses ethnicity, beliefs, traditions, diversities, and even nations. When you talk about culture, it, it, it encompasses all these things. But the root of it, when God intended it for, to be, he really started it from the human race. And then in the, when he made the human race, he made a human culture. And he made it in a way that was supposed to reflect him. It's called imagery. The power of imagery. 
He said, let us make man in our own image and in our likeness. Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, imagery is something that we have mishandled. Because imagery, amen, really came from God. He wanted us to reflect who he was. Can I get a witness? But when imagery has lost its value and lost its purpose and lost a bad its potential, then imagery looks for anything to identify itself with. So now we live in a in culture shocks when people are trying to find imagery in everything. Y'all may not like this. Are you hear what I'm saying? Whatever the TV projects is the imagery that our younger generations are trying to look like. How they dress. Y'all getting quiet on me in here. When we, a man, had dignity as a people and we teach our children, our girls to be little girls and not to look like young women. Y'all getting quiet up in here and teach a young boy to look clean cut and not have his pants hanging down but take some dignity in yourself. like I'm not in a Pentecostal church anymore. Everybody say imagery. If you look at now how these young generations are trying to look, it's a setup of the enemy to cause more misuse and abuse. Y'all don't hear me in here. It's an enticement so that the devil can snatch them out of our fingers and we pay the money for them to do it. Y'all like me? Because we have fallen away from some traditions that kept us sound, some traditions that kept us safe. Now they want to hang out all night long, and I know some of us did that too, but we had mamas and daddies that say you have, but let me tell you about this time. You better be in the house. Y'all don't want, y'all forgot about that? You, you better... As a matter of fact, you better be out there around that neighborhood at a certain time now, amen, because you can't hang down there too long because if you do, I'm coming. Y'all ain't never had Big Mama come? Big Mama come down there and tear the whole block up and will embarrass you in front of every. Grab you by your ears and come on here. And the boys on the corner going. <laughs> but the truth was, they scared too because they didn't know whether their parents was coming to. So, so, so we have to, in the beginning of this culture thing, we have to re-examine what the word says about culture. So, in, in right there in Genesis. It gives us a perfect picture of the potential of culture. God said, let us make man in our own image. He said, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the, over the cattle and over all of the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, here's what I like. He says, so God created man in his own image. Imagery. And then the image of God created he him. He had to see, he had to seal that. You know how you know how your mama didn't tell you the second time? Then I told you to do this right here. Then they come back and you didn't do it. Did, didn't I tell you? This was God is saying. He's trying to say, and so he says, and in the image he created. He, him, 
male and female. Created he them. There's no difference. Y'all getting quiet on me in here. He made it clear in the scriptures. Don't get mad at me. This is what the word says. And he says, now, since I'm giving them some imagery, I'm going to give them now some purpose. And I'm going to bless them because he says, I want my culture not only to take on my imagery, but I want my culture to be blessed, to take on the potential that I, and the power that I put in them. So the Bible says, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Every little creature. Now, watch this. Listen very close to this text. He never said that we were to have dominion over each other. Y'all getting quiet. He never said a race ought to have dominion over another race. He said you're supposed to have, amen, dominion over these little creatures on the earth. So we were never meant to be put in any kind of captivity from our own kind. Because we are all created equal. So when you sit in that classroom, you hold your head up just like any other culture to take the dignity in yourself and say, I'm going to do just as good as any other culture that I'm sitting in the classroom with. Don't get quiet on here with me. Because our children are so quick to say, I can't do this. But let me, let me say this. Let me, let me say this. And I'm going to say this out of all honesty. I'm glad that I went to a black college. Now, and if you didn't go, that's okay. Don't get mad. No, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not down in that. But I'm glad. I'm, I'm going to tell you why. I'm glad I went to a black college. Because what I goofed off in high school and didn't get when I got to college and your first year, you repeat what you went through in high school. Y'all don't like this up here. And it was looking Greek to me. The professor pulled me over and said, why are you not getting this? I said, I don't understand it. He said, this is what I need you to do. Get this book. Go to the library. Learn these fundamentals. And then come back to my class. Now, that's why I'm so grateful for the black college I went to because when I was in high school, they didn't care nothing about our culture, whether you failed or not. They used you for your talent, but not for your brain. So they'll put you on the basketball team, they'll put you on the football team, but they won't teach you how to get A's and B's. They'll let you stay there at a D, and you won't be functional to go to the next level. I know I'm talking truth in here because some of your children are struggling with it. They try to keep you in there. So my own mama didn't even know. All I had to do was go in that classroom and put my head on the desk and go to sleep. And they gave me a C. But when I got to the black college, I couldn't understand what they were telling me. And the professor said, boy, if you don't get yourself in that, in that library and learn this right here if in order to pass, I'm so grateful. They just want to shout, Nikki. They want, you to, they want you to hit them keys and say, we had a good time today. But I want you to be what God wants you to be. I wouldn't be a good spiritual father if I don't teach you how to be. Not what I want you to be, but what God wants you to be. 
Because even as I close out, even in this particular text here, you must understand, amen, the potential. Everybody say the potential. See, even when God created the whole race, the Bible says that the race was of one voice. It's in Genesis. And they decided that they were going to build a tower to reach heaven. Read it. It's in the scripture. And they got to building towers. They got to building cities. They got to building it so much that God came down and looked at them. And here's something God said about what he created. He said they are as one person or one people and they want to reach me. But they were trying it the wrong way. Y'all don't like just talk up in here. Because you can't reach God off of natural things and natural ideology. You, you can't reach heaven. And God said because they are one voice, they are building something great. So I got to do something about this. I'm just going to confound their language right now until they find, amen, until they come back to me. Now that was in Genesis, but when you go to Acts. The Bible said that they came from all cultures, but when they went to the upper room, y'all don't hear me up in here, glory to God, when they heard from heaven then, they all started speaking the same type of language. Oh, my God. And the languages came back together when they understood their potential. So tell somebody, say, as a culture, we can do anything. So he says to them, I want you to, be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to replenish. I want you to subdue, and I want you to have dominion. As I conclude, here it is. Here it is. It's not just procreation. It's not about having children. It's not about having children. We had children for years. God wasn't necessarily always talking about having children. In the scripture, he says, be fruitful. When you understand the Hebrew definition of it, it means to bring life into, into a place of fulfillment. He said, if you're going to be fruitful, you are called as a culture to bring life into a place of fulfillment. As a people, let me talk to my people, as a people. We are called to bring life to a place of fulfillment. We are supposed to multiply. That simply means to invest into others, to reproduce after your own kind. So if we're going to multiply right according to the plan of culture that God original plan, we're supposed to be able, amen, to invest so that we can cause people to reproduce after our own kind. And then to replay, everybody say to replenish. Here's what I, to replenish, he said, you need to leave a significant deposit for the next generation. To subdue, you need to teach each other how, or teach others how to overcome through godly strategies to secure purpose in life. To have dominion, he said, you need to teach how to manage and lead for the kingdom of God. This was the original plan for culture, amen, that God created, and then when we divided and went and became different cultures, the same principle applies to each culture. So as a culture of black people, God says that we got to multiply, we've got to replenish, we've got to be fruitful, and we've got to do it not according to just procreation. we got to do it according to God's master plan. Tell somebody, say, take some pride in yourself. Everybody stand. I hope I said something. Did this help somebody? Young people, don't miss this series. Tell some other young people. Because when I come back, I'm going to Africa. I'm going to the motherland. 
I'm going where the culture started. It's so ironic on, 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 this, on this month. It's so ironic that we're going to Africa on Black History Month. So when I come back, I'm going to have some African anointing on me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And I want to teach our young people. So, hey amen, bring your children. Don't, don't, don't bring your little children because we need to teach them the value of our culture. Some of us are not meant to be run. Some of us are meant to run things. I know what I'm talking about. I sat at a table with a young man behind the prison walls. He was between 18 and 21. He walked in my office and he said, Chaplain, I just want to tell you, I'm not in here for a violent crime. I didn't kill nobody. I didn't murder nobody. I didn't mug nobody. I said, well, boy, what you in here for? He said, I'm in here because I was able to tap into the ATM machine. I said, boy, if you're able to get into that, you ought to be running an IBM. Because anytime that you can get into an ATM machine without pulling it off the wall, You got a mind. Can I get a witness? I seen a young man make a key out of melting plastic or a plastic spoon to fit a lock. Can I get a witness? And you heard me say it. If a brother can stand on the corner, if he can dice up that, that cocaine and dice up, amen, and break it down and get him a whole army and put it together and run a whole monopoly, he's an entrepreneur. And you got to understand, even when you make a mistake and you get labeled by society, that don't stop you from being who God wants you to be. Amen. I don't care if they say you're an ex-offender, you can still turn that around and become an entrepreneur. But we can't do it until we teach. Our children and our parents need to along with me. Lift your hands to heaven and say, God, help me. Lift your, keep your hand there. Father, thank you for this series on the power of culture. We're not only going to talk about a culture as a black people, but we're going to talk about culture in many ways. And we're going to also talk about church culture. Because church culture ain't where it's supposed to be. So God, as we begin to teach this series... Let it change the hearts and the minds of your people. Let it change the hearts of your people. But help us today to let us know we have potential, that we can be what you want us to be. Reignite our dreams and our hopes. Put back in us, God, vision to become. And then give us strategies to be impactful. We thank you for our history because God, it's 114 inventions that we made in America. We built America based on what the potential was in us. But now calls us now to take this place and take our rightful place in our society. That we can be as impactful as every other nation. And we'll give you the glory. We're going to overlook prejudice. We're going to overlook racism. We're going to overlook bias, but we're going to take pride according to your word because in your word, you made us to be great. Now come on and give God praise. If you believe that greatness is in you, come on, you believe greatness is in you? As a matter of fact, shake three people's hand and say greatness is all over you. Come on, shake their hand and say you're born to be great. We're not putting down any other race, but I just want to let my people know you're born to be great. So that's why we got to break every chain. Come on, we're going to break every chain. Come on, sing it with our daughter. We're going to break every chain. How many were blessed by the word? If you were blessed by this ministry, what we do, 
we tithe and we give in an offering because we bless the place that bless us. To you that are listening online, if this bless you, if you like to tithe, you can tithe. If you don't have a church, we invite you to tithe. We invite you to give. If you have a church, tithe to your church. Give to your church. But I love my church. How many love your church? I love my church. Look at somebody as you lift it up. Say, I love my church. And I support my church. And I believe the word that God will supply all of my needs. Father, I thank you and I bless you today for the opportunity to give and to bless this ministry. And we honor you with the tithe and an offering to say you're first in our lives. And as we give, rebuke the hands of the devourer, cause us to come forward in our time, and we'll give you glory, we'll give you honor, we'll give you praise in Jesus' wonderful and matchless name that the people of God say praise him. You may give. Thank you again for listening online. We look to see you and hear you, hear from you by way of sharing and tagging this wonderful ministry. Next Sunday, same time, same place, grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh